Welcome back to the Shine Within podcast. Dr. Marsha Martin is a spiritual empowerment counselor and a clairaudient angel communicator who specializes in helping people heal their relationship with themselves. Her own transformative journey taught her the power of thoughts in shaping reality. She now uses this knowledge along with guidance from the angelic realm to help others release fears, frustrations, and limiting beliefs leading to a life of joy. With a PhD in theology and master's degree in psychology and metaphysics, Dr. Martin is also an ordained metaphysical minister, best-selling author, and speaker. Her focus is on healing from emotional pain and trauma, especially from narcissistic relationships, empowering individuals to live their dreams. What an honor to have you on my show, Dr. Marsha. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having this incredible space so we can talk about these things that are life-changing. Yes, and I was just sharing with you that I... <laughs> went through some things, didn't grow up religious or spiritual, but I had experienced a lot of childhood trauma, then got into bad relationships, got into drugs and alcohol. And then I saw my life going downhill until it was a hospital visit from, uh, from preconchitis. And the doctor says, you have about 10 years to live. If you quit drinking, you will live. If you stay continue this path and you're going to die. So I had to make the choice for myself. And I said, what a wonderful opportunity for me to go ahead. And since I'm already at the hospital, detox and start brand new. And it was actually at a faith-based hospital that I was at. And I had like some chaplain oh. pray over me. And I remember the doctor who was talking to me very sternly and sharing with me like, you're da -da 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 -da. I'm like, Ugh. but I saw <laughs> her necklace across there. Right. And I was like, okay, I'm sensing something here, you know, and at that hospital, nobody visited me. I was there for a week recovering. Oh. And I was really sitting with myself. I think I upset at everybody at that time. <laughs> I was really myself and my spirit and God. I felt like, okay, I have to make a change. But I would love for you to start by telling us about your journey as a spiritual empowerment counselor and what led you to focus on helping people recover from abuse and trauma. Well, you know, I would love to tell you that I woke up one day and realized my life was terrible and I made the decision to change. But what I did was throw away everything I learned at least three times before I got to the place of enough, enough desperation that I began to take it seriously and really start paying attention to these techniques so it wasn't a quick journey. It was a long and painful journey to the bottom and a long climb up because I needed to learn all of this in a way that I could then teach it. So what I get to do now is shorten the journey for you. So I have no regrets that it took me a good 10 years to master this. But I am so excited that part of my life is over. <laughs> so if you are in any win, one of the places, if you are still lost in the drugs and the alcohol or the abuse or the belief that you are not enough, or if they're anywhere along the way, you're just feeling like life is struggle. Mm -hmm. Life is not worth living. Life is difficult. If that describes you, please take this moment to say, I have a choice. I can do the pain and struggle and the hard knock life, or I can step over into spirituality, which is not religion. I can step over into spirituality and do ease and joy. And it is really that simple. Because now we have programs that can help you easily. We have a much greater understanding. And we have evolved as a world to understand spirituality and separate it from religion. So you're getting really a partnership with the divine as opposed to a formula that may or may not work for you. Yes. And I noticed for myself, because since I didn't grow up religious or spiritual, when I was going through my journey, I, after I 
left the hospital, I decided to no longer drink anymore and I wanted to get connected to God. And so I wanted to join a Christian church because that's where Jesus, <laughs> everyone knows Jesus in a Christian church. That's who I felt like I was aligned to or, you know, something was going on there. And I felt it because I went in there and I just started crying, like ever, like bawling. I'm like, why am I crying? It's just like, I just felt like I belonged there. Like I felt that energy and I just felt like I belonged. So I, what did I do? I started going to um, serving there. I was actually part of the women's Bible group. I was uh, also serving their little picnics that they would uh, host, you know, at Lake Elizabeth in Fremont. And I was just doing all these things. I actually signed up for a membership there. But then I, you know, I actually met my husband there. <laughs> Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, which was nice because I was doing children's ministry and his son is uh, a year older than my son. Uh, and so they're really young in age. He's only nine and ten, eight years old right now. And everything just worked out beautifully. But then as I am going to going to these uh, services, I'm noticing like, huh, I'm starting to question things and I'm like, this doesn't really make sense. Like they're talking about Jesus here, but then they're talking about like this Old Testament here about you must do this and this and rules, 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 shame, shame, shame on me. I'm a sin. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. It's like, I didn't feel like that. I'm like, well, wait, I'm a, I just like died from myself or whatever. <laughs> How am I sinning? You know, so I didn't feel like something was off. And then I started going into the space of like, okay. Let me just go ahead and pray to Jesus. And I'd always pray like, Lord Jesus, please help me. I need to know, give me your wisdom. I want to know your wisdom, what you know, how I'm supposed to live my life. And then slowly I'm getting all this information just so happened, you know, and then I started noticing things and I'm like, whoa. So I was doing more research, more research. And I was like really getting into the whole metaphysical. <laughs> I was like, this has gone beyond me now. This is <laughs> this is interesting. Um, but I was learning how to actually love myself and I was learning about my energy and I was breaking out of like that an insecure area. And so, and I know you emphasize the importance of healing the energetic heart space. Can you explain what this means and why it's so crucial for recovery? Absolutely. But first, I just want to make a distinction because spirituality does not confine itself to any particular religion. Mm -hmm. And Jesus happens to be the name that the Christian religion gave to the energy, which is the Christ consciousness. And what that means is unconditional love and acceptance. So there is an energy that was embodied by the historical figure that came by the name of Jesus, also Muhammad, Buddha. There are many different uh, figures throughout time that have embodied this energy. So those of us who grew up Christian generally say Jesus, but it is all the same energy. It's that Christ consciousness. It's the love that surpasses all understanding. It is absolutely unconditional in its acceptance of you and it will transport you from that place of depression to a place where you're able to operate in joy. So you are going to be working when you work in the heart with the Christ consciousness. You can call it anything. It doesn't have to be called Jesus if you find that offensive. It works for me. Doesn't matter what works for you. You find what works for you and understand this energy here in the heart center is the Christ consciousness. And that simply means the light, the love, the joy, the peace, the absolute acceptance of who you are. And that once you are in partnership with that, it is so easy to love you because suddenly you're not looking at what's wrong. You are not sitting there wagging your finger. Oh, look what you did now. You're so stupid. Oh, I can't believe you did that. 
this is not going on because you're being infused with this incredible love. And instead, you are guided to say, oh, you see that way that you speak to yourself, that way that is so condemning? Wouldn't it be more lovely if you were able to honor yourself instead? And so when you work in that heart space, they're with you, giving you choices, saying, hey, you know, do you like the result of being so cruel and mean-spirited to yourself? Or are you ready to try a lighter, brighter, more loving way? Let's release this energy that's keeping you stuck in this negative pattern. And except in its place, this energy that we represent, which is love, find something about yourself that's good and dwell on that. We're never going to get there from the critical place. And I never understand. I began my career as a teacher. Oh, nice. And those children that I was assigned, this one particular pivotal year for me, were the ones that were going to fail. They had already been identified as failures. These are third graders. And this is when we're doing end of grade tests, first year, and everybody gets a thousand dollar bonus. If these third graders can pass their test, enough of them, doesn't have to be a hundred percent, but most of them have to pass. So I got hired to help these kids <laughs> transform their grades from F to C or B, preferably B. Maybe if we're really lucky, A. Well, I thought I was there to transform their grades. They taught me that when I spoke to their heart and I saw them as worthy and as intelligent as and valuable, they could turn into children who could learn. It was so life-changing for me. But what was most interesting is I took that lesson and applied it out here, but I was still so condemning. <laughs> I was like, how did I manage to only apply that to anyone I was interacting with? And when I got here, I would be like, well, that was a stupid thing you just did. It took falling face first in the mud crawling around in the mud for a while, falling down again and again and again before I was willing to get up and say, oh, I really am tired of being a dirty. There's got to be a different way. So I, <laughs> <laughs> we are so good at fooling ourselves. And this energy is so perfect at guiding us into truth without ridiculing us it does and you remind me I actually was one of those third grade students too <laughs> <laughs> I remember it was like my reading or something was off and I was like why am I in this small classroom you know <laughs> I had to excuse myself from in my original classroom and go inside another classroom some of us and a couple other students in the class and then we were just getting extra um help with our reading yeah, but my teacher in third grade, she was evil. She was mean. So I did horribly. I think I was getting D's in there. And then it wasn't until my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Singer, she's maybe listening to this right now. <laughs> she's on my Facebook. Oh, <laughs> <But> I, <laughs> we I just, love you. <laughs> yes, she's the one who changed my life. I remember um, she loved me and saw me like I can do more. And she made me have build that confidence in me. So I appreciate you teachers so much because you do make a big difference in our lives. And I uh, remember I was getting honor roll from there, even though I was going through my other stuff and whatever, but I was going through, I had honor roll until like my senior year in high school. So she was the one who made that big impact or created that big impact in my life. So I, I, I hold all the teachers dear in my heart. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. And but Look at that. I mean, as teachers, we are all like brain focused. I, I was in love with the brain. I even have a master's in educational developmental psychology 
And most of that was spent in abnormal psych. You know, if I can just understand how you think mm -hmm. I can do, you know, I'll make you smart. You were already brilliant. You just needed someone to believe in you, to see you, to speak to you as though you mattered and to pull from you what you was already within. If we teach from the heart, the head can get it. There are more neurons going from the heart to the head than from the head to the heart. So if we speak first as teachers, parents, authority figures in any way, speak to the heart, tell the being, whether it is you or anyone else, you are magnificent. That's amazing. I'm so proud of you. You are really brilliant. Speak those words of affirmation. And then the fear that you will get it wrong or be rejected or made fun of is going to disappear. And suddenly you can pay attention. And then when you're actually paying attention, you learn something. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> and that's what I try to teach my children too. I, Growing up, you know, my mom was working constantly. And so of course I had like my siblings who are a lot older than I, than I am. They were taking care of me and they didn't say the nicest things <laughs> to me growing up. And I always sure took that they, did, <laughs> they did not love taking care of you and we get it. But still, no matter where you are in the birth order, in the family, be the one, even if your parents can't do it, be the one that is modeling speaking from the heart. Mm -hmm. Be the one that when somebody is really nasty, you say, gosh, I'm sorry you're having a rough day. Is there something I can do? Instead of, hey, how dare you say that to me? It, <laughs> the coming from love just flows. The coming in retaliation creates that stop sign. It makes everything. Now you're butting heads instead of connecting hearts. Right. Yes, I totally agree. And sometimes my reactions and however I responded before was just like, they're so well, angry <laughs> you're on the defensive because nobody is speaking to the heart the heart is hurting yeah nobody is speaking or seeing you or or caring what's going on here and so the heart whose job is to protect says oh really well if you're going to treat us that way not only are we going to be prepared but we are going to dish out some of that to you it's not going to get you anywhere. First of all, the heart doesn't understand this going into battle is not protection. The greatest protection you can ever give yourself is to go into the space of love, joy, and peace because you will be flowing in such harmony with all the beautiful synchronicities that are happening that all of this stuff that's happening down there, you might notice, you might not, but you'll be like, oh, have a lovely day and you'll just keep walking along. <laughs> Whereas all the people who are in the space of competition or pain or trauma or suffering of any kind are gonna be scratching at each other. Hmm. Go up here. This is where the divine are. Mm -hmm. Go join them. They're not going to come here. They don't understand this. They don't even understand that this exists because for them in their completeness, they exist in the space of love, joy, and peace. And they say, come join us. Not because they don't care that you're down there, but because they know that this is for your highest good. So rather than dissipate them themselves by going down here and sitting in the mud with you and saying, so why are you feeling bad today? They say, hey, you know what? Just let go of those burdens and join us. It's beautiful up here. I love that. Yes. And so my husband and I, whenever, if one of us are having a bad day, you know, the other, well, myself or my husband, depending on who's having the bad day, We'll say, you know, hey, do you need a hug? Is something I can do to help you? And it does bring down that 
that anger oh, or frustration yes. tremendously. Hey, what, what happened that is got you here? How it's, can I support you in getting back to the place that would feel good? Yes, and it helps so much because then I feel like, oh, he cares. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I am okay. <laughs> I okay. just needed to know that there is somebody that cares whether or not I am able to hold my high vibration. And let's remember, you will, that life is not so challenge free that you're just going to be up here on your own little flying carpet. You're going to take dips down and that's okay. Sometimes we need to go here to appreciate what's going on up here that makes this so much more interesting and exciting and worth working for. So the dips are good. The climb back up is good because you learn so much. You get resilience. You have a, a better understanding of what it is that may be working against you and what is working for you. So it's all good, but nobody is going to, nobody does this. <laughs> so if you think that's what your life has to be, if you are spiritually awakened and motivated, then you're setting yourself up for failure. And it's not a lot of fun. It's so much more fun to go along here and then say, you know, I want a new challenge. I want to try something new. Recognizing that the challenge is probably up here and you're going to try and you're probably going to go down here because you're going to get frustrated. <laughs> you're not going to know all the stuff. It's going to be some learning and there's going to be some negativity that happens. It's okay. It's all part of growing into your your fullness, your wholeness. Yes, absolutely. And now self-love is a term that we hear often, you know, oh, just love yourself, love yourself, love yourself. <laughs> but it seems like frequently misunderstood, I feel. Um, how do you define self-love and why is it so important? I'm going to define self-love as grace. Mm -hmm. The ability to look at you as you are and say, I love you. And the opportunity to say, I am perfect in this moment. When they first shared that idea with me, I was really hesitant to get on that bandwagon. I thought, oh, you know, that, that, mm, I'm not so, that doesn't feel comfortable. I've got a lot of things that are not so perfect. And they, I'm, I refer to God as mother, father, God, because it gives me more of a feeling of completion. And so they said to me, what you are is perfect. What you are not yet is complete. So every time we embark on a new life journey, we are perfect for that journey. We have brought everything we need to successfully complete that journey. And the final goal of every journey is to end more like the divine than we began. Greater knowledge, greater awareness, more of a partnership, even on the, the times that we take detours and we never acknowledge that there is a divine presence, you're still gaining understanding of where God is not or what God is not. So what they like to say is we are perfect. We are perfect for the moment that we are occupying. Now, this doesn't mean that you're perfect for yesterday or for tomorrow, but you're not in yesterday and you're not in tomorrow. In this moment, you are perfect, no matter what you are doing, because all of it works together for your greatest good. All of the failures climb up <laughs> the pile to give you these experiences that will encourage you to really dig down and find out who you are. 
all of the times that you succeeded give you the excitement and the enthusiasm to keep going. So there's nothing that you can do that is so horrible that you're out. Mm -hmm. There are only learning experiences. And if you allow yourself to be perfect, you will be much more enthusiastic about the journey. If you're always telling yourself, and I was guilty of this, oh, I'm a work in progress, <laughs> or I'm not perfect, or I'm perfectly imperfect. And all the while, it just felt like, oh, do I ever get to feel good? And when I tell myself, you know, I love me. I'm perfect as I am. I now have enthusiasm to start working on that aspect of myself that I know could use a little brush up because I have given myself acknowledgement, honor, grace. And so I've, that's my little rocket booster. <laughs> yes. I always say I, whenever I do something and then I'm like, oh, I messed up. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give myself some grace here. I always say that to myself. And so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, what I was going to go ahead and uh, tell you is that a lot of women tend to neglect themselves, especially as mothers. We always like give, give, give to our children. <laughs> um, why do you think this pattern is so prevalent? Whoa, I would say we, we've been fed this from the cradle. <laughs> this is not a new thing. Now, as a mother myself, I absolutely love my children and certainly put them ahead of myself most times. It's okay to love your children. Yes, you are the caretaker. You are the adult. You are the one that knows how to help them navigate their life for the greatest experience, but you are worthy too. So Mother God explained this to me in a way that changed my life. Unfortunately, my children were almost grown when I learned it. So I spent all of their younger years um, exhausting myself and then wondering why I didn't feel good about myself or I was feeling resentful or depressed or anxious or whatever it may be. We are not the Energizer Bunny. We are going to run out. I don't care how devoted you are to your children. There's only so much of you that you have to offer. And one of the things that was always most difficult for me is that I had been told that I was selfish or that being selfish was like the ultimate sin. And I so desperately wanted to be seen as good. Now, no self-confidence, no self-esteem. So I needed everything to come from out here. You had to tell me I was a good person so I could believe it. So I would run myself ragged doing for others in the hopes that they would see me as a selfless person. And early on in the journey... I would have daily conversations, well, still do, but in this particular case <laughs> with, with Mother God, and I would just, you know, sort of be, I hope she's going to say something nice. <laughs> and I went into one of those meditative periods and I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. I, I'm just exhausted. I don't understand. I'm trying so hard to be everything to everyone. I don't want to look selfish and oh, just help me. She said, well, you are being selfish. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm crushed. I just, there's no further I can fall. I am so crushed. I, I've tried so hard. Now I'm failing at this. She said, it's because you don't understand the difference between selfish and selfless. So let me explain. She said, when you give from your humanness, which is what I was doing, there was just me. When you give from your humanness, you create dependency. 
you give and you give and you give and you give of you, which cannot be replenished. There's not another you. You keep giving of you and then you have all these little dependents that are dependent on you. And when you exhaust yourself, which is inevitable, now all those who are dependent on you are suffering. That is selfish. She said, we want you to be selfless. So first, we're going to ask you to fill. Just open your heart and begin allowing yourself to fill. To fill and to fill and to fill. Until you're overflowing. You will not give from within. You will give from the overflow. Because when you stay connected, this fountain of love that we share with you, this unconditional love and acceptance that you are receiving continuously, will flow out into the world and positively affect everyone and everything you interact with. And you will not create dependency because they will be encouraged to create that well for themselves, to create that well that never runs dry. So why are women taught that we should give of our humanness? It, I believe it is just incorrect teaching. It is not understanding that we are not to be here as our human selves. We are in a physical vessel, but we are to be partnered with the divine so that we experience the physical journey and we have this infallible, un, uh, infallible continuous guidance system that will help make this journey easier. But we are given the choice because we are here as free will beings. So if we all came and God said, okay, now you get to have that body and look like that and have those experiences and I'll tell you when to stop and when to go, where's the learning? Mm -hmm. It's We're just marionettes on a string. So we're given free will. We are wiped free of that understanding that we can be in a partnership. We are allowed to stumble around in the dark and say, where is the darn light switch? We are allowed to grow as it serves us. And they are with us always pushing us in the direction of our greatest good without interfering so that we get the experience of learning. Otherwise, it would be the teacher in the classroom writing on the board, saying to the class, and who knows the answer to five plus four, and then saying, oh, never mind, I'm going to tell you. Well, it's nine. Okay, now that you all know how to add, here are worksheets to make sure that you understand. Oh, never mind. I'm going to collect them all and do them and give them back to you so that you can throw them away. We don't learn mm -hmm. by sitting and being vegetables. We need to interact. So I think it's just poor teaching. <laughs> I, it got mm -hmm. started. And it, <laughs> unfortunately, that train of thought is dying a long time painful death <laughs> yes and we're here to experience everything as much as we can and a lot of people grapple with the questions well who am I why am I here you know where am I going <laughs> now how do you actually guide individuals to find answers to these types of questions well the who am I is maybe better said who am I not <laughs> you are not anyone else who am I? You are this beautiful being that is perfect for your life. Let's explore what you love, what you don't enjoy doing, what you do well, what you don't do well. Let's look at what you came with that you want to expand upon. That's who you are. And it has nothing to do with these people out here. They don't get a vote. They they are no, 
unless they are saying, you're amazing, you're magnificent, they don't get a vote. So that, that that's who are you and why am I here to explore, to find out what it feels like to come with your particular skill set, your choice of challenges, your physical attributes or lack of, and live your life from that way. And by lack of physical attributes, I mean, let's say I chose to come as a quadriplegic or to have that accident somewhere along the way. This is not me getting in trouble with God or having been bad in a previous life. This is me exploring what my life could be like if I no longer have the use of my limbs. What else can I learn? How else can I challenge myself? How far can I go with this new way of being? So it's so important that we don't place any limits on ourselves or ask for anybody else's opinion. Mm -hmm. They may understand themselves, but they sure don't understand you. Go here, go right here. What feels good to you? And then what is my purpose? That's another big one. I used to believe it was hidden. I used to think, oh, I'm going to go on this big journey. Maybe I'll I'll do a round the world tour to find my purpose. <laughs> and it was so like, oh, that's how you do it. I was kind of <laughs> just kind of disappointed, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> truly, your purpose is what speaks to your heart. What do you do well? What do you have a natural affinity for? What would you do if there was no job attached to it? What would you do just for fun? And what lights you up so much that you can't wait to share it? That is really your purpose. That's where you are going to shine the most. That's where you're going to be willing to put the time and the energy into learning about it. If it's a, if an athletic attribute, doing the um, exercise to be the better tennis player or basketball player or whatever it is, it's you're going to be talented, but you're still going to need to practice no matter what it is. But you are going to have a natural affinity for this thing and it calls to you like nothing else. So if I'm going to sit down and be a concert pianist and I am uncoordinated, that's not a good match. You are living somebody else's dream and trying to pretend that it's yours. If you're going to be and you are serious that your passion is being a concert pianist, you will have some sense of the piano and of music. It will make sense to you in a way that it may not make sense to another person. And it will bring you joy and fulfillment. Yes, I've been getting signs that I'm supposed to be learning how to play the violin. And I'm seeing yeah. it everywhere. And I'm like, I love the violin. I love the way it sounds, you know, That's and I just, sound. it's so beautiful. And so I told my husband, I was like, I think you might have to get a violin. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. And, you know, just remember, because sometimes when we think, oh, this would be so great. And we start out and we're not master musicians. We get so discouraged. But no, that's not. It's not the way it works. You will have some natural affinity, but you're still going to need the lessons. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to give myself grace if I mess up because <laughs> it is my choice to want to have to, and play it. So yeah. 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 So your angel heart healing technique, that's quite unique, actually. Could you actually explain how it works and its benefits and healing relationships to oneself? Absolutely. So all of the work that I do, and it's mostly geared toward helping people clear abuse and trauma. So whatever past abuse and trauma you may have, we have to understand that it creates subconscious programming. Mm -hmm. So 
And let's also be clear that trauma is not necessarily the same for me as it was for you. Let's say to me, the most traumatizing thing that has ever happened in my life is that I missed the bus and I was late for work. And that just undid me. Whereas you happen to be present for a school shooting. All right. Now, on the surface, it looks like, whoa, you you won the trauma lottery. It doesn't matter. If I am deeply affected by that experience of I missed the bus, I am going to create a whole trauma drama around it. And that means a lot of heavy negative energy. And it's also going to create an automatic response, a fear, a flight, or a fright response. Because the heart's job is, hey, we're not letting bad things happen to you. So, uh-oh, you missed the bus? Oh, that was frightening and just undid you. We are going to make sure that when that happens or when it's likely that that is going to happen, we have a response all set up so you will be ready to go and you won't experience that again. So that gets stored over in the subconscious mind and which feeds into the brain. Uh-oh, we're on alert. We need to be high anxiety. Now, you're not aware of what you're doing, but over the years, you are just taking more and more negative stimuli and plunking it over here in the subconscious until your whole energetic field is just black energy that is heavy and weighing you down. And I thought it was normal to speak to myself with such criticism and cruelty that people would be like, oh, <laughs> to me, it was like, eh, I deserved it. I would, <laughs> I'm shocked at what I believed was acceptable. But all of that was like a black mass that was impenetrable. And so that was what was feeding my brain constantly. You know, we need to be better than what we were because what we were, you know, we're not really not that great. So we just got to keep <laughs> trying. Oh, you know, you've got to get up earlier, stay up later, do more work, win every award and don't expect to feel good about it. Just... <laughs> get up and get going again. That award's won. Now you're on to the next one. So all of this was just like dense, stagnant energy. Mm. And it needed to be cleared because it was preventing me from having any connection to the divine. Now we all have a connection. And when we are in our place of trauma and negativity, it's about as open as this. Maybe you get here. <laughs> so there's a little <laughs> tiny bit of pinprick of light, a little bit of love trickling in that's keeping you operating. Right. As, as you clear it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And suddenly you're filled with love instead of with this dark, dense negativity. And so this technique uses the energy of the Christ consciousness. And we go look at all of these things. Gosh, you were late for the bus. And, you know, that just flipped you over into crazy land of anxiety. How is that serving you? Uh, <laughs> not very well. <laughs> now, because we have this energy of love and acceptance, it doesn't feel, you know, I, I don't go over there. Oh, you idiot. <laughs> Why are you holding on to that? I go over there and say, wow, look at what that's doing. That is so negatively impactful. That is really hard to carry around. Oh, man, help me release this from my energetic field. So then the angelic community comes forward and they help release it. We give it back to the divine 
And then we replace it with more loving and accepting energy. So you've got to be really careful never to just release something and leave a big empty space. Because you have not been practicing whatever negative thing you've got going on for a minute. You've been doing it for a long period of time. It's become a habit. So you're going to do this lovely work to clear away this heavy energy. You're going to give it away. You're going to feel great for a second. And then it's going to feel weird. And you're going to say, oh, you know, like, huh, where's that familiar energy? I, I don't like this. <laughs> so what you have to make sure, give it away, release it, and then fill yourself with unconditional love and acceptance. I call it the light of the Holy Spirit. Fill yourself with that. It's going to be your placeholder. It's going to say, no, you're better than this. Stay in this high place. We're bringing you joy. And that's going to be enough to hold you. You're going to say, oh, this does feel good. And I don't need to there's no empty. There's no searching around for something to fill. I'm filled and I like it. So I always call it giving yourself a new name. So the place we went to clear may have been called, um, I'm a stupid idiot. The place that takes its place is I am a beautiful being of love. Yeah, well, I love that. <laughs> I like that more than I'm a stupid idiot. <laughs> I am a being of love. And that's something I used to call myself too before and not anymore. <laughs> now, what it is was, it? Yeah, it was, to me, it was perfectly normal to be completely disparaging and then turn around to you and say, you are such a lovely individual. And people would be like, <laughs> right? thank you. <laughs> why did you just say you're such a stupid idiot? I was like, oh, I did? Yeah. Oh, well, like, you know, I am. That was kind of stupid. And they would be like, okay. It was yeah. such a disconnect, but it was perfectly normal for me. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened after all those years is I just go, more and more exhausted mm -hmm. and less and less capable of getting to a higher place. It just dragged me down until down was all that was left. Right now. Um, yeah. Same with me. Like I always would ask like, Hey, would you talk to your kid that way or a stranger? <laughs> Why are Ever. you talking to yourself Never. like that? <laughs> you know? to remind myself because sometimes <laughs> I catch myself like well this is how it is now I'll be like oh Gina why did you do that you silly girl you know but then it's like you can do better after I say something I can like rip myself on you can do better <laughs> you know I'd rather you change that to you're amazing I'm yeah. so proud of you look at what you've been able to do you know I am sure you'll next time you'll be able to do even more so even if it was not great, you know, that's amazing. Good for you. I'm proud of you. Be in that space. Start off in a good place instead of, so end in a good place so you can start off in a better place. So one of the techniques they taught me is I still have a tendency to work too long especially if I get on a project, I'm like, I just want to finish. I just want to finish. I just want to, some things cannot be finished without exhausting you. They need, you need to take a break. You are making the same mistake over and over and over again. And so they caught me on that and they said, okay, stop when you have accomplished something and you are saying to yourself, well, I could do more. Take your break there. So you end on a high note. And when you start again, you're not coming back. Oh my God, I'm so tired. You're coming back. Hey, oh, that went well. 
All righty, let's get started. And then you will see this typo or the other, the, whatever the thing was that wasn't coming clear will be so much easier to see because you will have left on a high note and you're going to begin again on a even higher note. Right. And I, I hear you saying that, oh, they're, they're speaking to me. They're speaking to me. It's very interesting because I'm getting that too. I, I It's like a, a knowing kind of um, where same situation where I was working so much that I, I felt them so take a break, take it. You need a break. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a break. And then I took my break and then I came back and then I was able to figure everything out that I needed to figure out that I was having a hard time. Yes. <laughs> and you know, if you can take that break before you get your to the place where you're saying, or um, take that break without feeling guilty you know, don't add on the guilt piece. Yeah. Well, I'm taking a break, but I really feel guilty. No, you don't. I'm taking a break to honor myself, to allow myself to reset, to really recalibrate and refill. And I'll begin again and take a break again before I hit that exhaustion place. Yes. And my mom, she reminded me of my mom. She um, is always busy, busy. And like, I have to do this. She has a list of like all the things she needs to do. And I need to do this, 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 this. Well, finally I came over to her house and she's like, I'm going to go ahead and lay down. And I was like, oh, finally, she's taking a break. But then she comes back to me and tells me, oh yeah, don't mind me. I'm just resting right now. And then keeps on repeating the same thing. Don't mind me. I'm like, mom, you don't have to justify why you're resting. You're 70 something years old. Take a but break. again, that's that societal conditioning. Right. Women, you really shouldn't rest because who knows why? I never quite understood the rationale. I just knew it really wasn't permissible for me to rest if someone else was doing something because I needed to be the hardest worker out of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, the world could take a rest, but it was not acceptable for me. Don't ask me why. Because I have no rationale. <laughs> that was just the conditioning was resting is not approved. Working is acceptable. Right. Yeah. Now, see, our listeners are like so intrigued by everything that you're saying. And they're like, well, I want to know how I can either work with her or maybe see her at a workshop, get her book. <laughs> how can our <laughs> listeners connect with you? Well, I am so excited to share. Mm -hmm. We have just expanded. So now we have become a foundation. We are now the Heart Healing Foundation. And that means that we can offer pay what you can counseling. You can work with me privately. That's a separate track, but you can do that all, all on the same website. And if you are able to pay what it costs for the group counseling. Yes, please. You are making it possible for someone else to pay what they can. But we're now able to say, come on, just get the help that you need. Pay us what you can. And if it's nothing, that's okay. You can help us another way. So come on. We are delighted excited and overjoyed that you're going to be joining us because sharing this is the greatest thing ever. And we just wanted to make it accessible for everyone. So it is the Heart Healing Foundation. The private counseling is still, it's one price because you help support the others and you are taking all of my time. So if you are on a limited budget, the group will work for you. And it not only does it give you access to all of the tools, because I'm going to teach exactly the same thing. It's just in a group, the time is split, but also in a group, you develop friendships. You have a support system. There are other beings that want to see you succeed as much as I do. So it's what feels best to your heart, what you think is going to work. But we welcome all of you. And if you love self-study, just join our Patreon group. It's called My Heart's Desire. 
because God really does want to give you the desires of your heart. And within that group, it is all of the techniques. They're just in a line. I've got to organize them. That just now became available. <laughs> so <laughs> give me some time. Um, but it's just every technique you can imagine. And by that, I mean, oh, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Okay, we have a technique for that. Oh, I really want to help, but uh, some situations it's not appropriate. We have a technique for that. Oh, I'm feeling... Um, disorganized we have a technique it's <laughs> addressing all of life's issues with a spiritual technique something that will help you get going or see the bigger picture or have an understanding of what you are going to expect as a consequence based on the decision today it's just life made easy Oh, yes. And any way you can make life easier, I'm in and all for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me too. Because I did it the hard way for a long, long time. I did not start getting serious about my spiritual walk until I was almost 50. So I am so amazed by all of you that have, are getting it early on i'm so proud of all of you because your life is going to be so much more magical and you are going to have such a positive impact on everyone around you congratulations for those of you who are getting hold of these principles and not letting go but if you're like me and you started studying them in my late teens and threw them all away in my early 30s. <laughs> if, if that's you, it's not too late. It is never too late to get a hold of these spiritual principles and universal truths and begin applying them in your life. Yes, I love that. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Marsha, for joining me on my show today. It's been an honor and such a pleasure. I am so enjoyed my time. And I'm so grateful for you doing what you do and for having this platform. Thank you so much.